what we're going to try and do this now in this first of the panel sessions is really start to get practical. <coughs> so what does this mean for businesses and what are businesses doing now to embrace the change that's happening and also to future-proof to embrace the change that's going to happen over the next five, ten years. I've got two hats on while I work for PwC uh, as a consultant working with clients, but also within PwC we're going through a profound change in the firm as we adopt artificial intelligence into our business and create an artificially intelligent firm. Um, so I've kind of got two hats on. Um, I'm not going to introduce the panel, a very esteemed panel of uh, both business and academia. Um, I'm not going to introduce them, but what I am going to do is ask them to say a few words about what they're doing um, and answer the first question that I'd like to ask. Um, and it will be open to the audience as well, so if you can come with questions as well. But the first question I'd like to ask is kind of what's happening in your world and what's the practical impact of AI today? And Matthew, I'd like to ask you first if, if you could pick that one up. Hello. So, uh, so thanks, Mike. I'm <coughs> Matthew Fryer. I'm the, the Another awesome title of Chief Data Science Officer at Expedia and Hotels.com. So I think um, I've been in the analytics and data science space for getting only a couple of decades. Um, but I haven't seen the pace of change that, whether it's machine learning, data science, artificial intelligence, and that spectrum has transformed what we do in the last few years. It's almost the same change I saw for the first sort of 18. Uh, and it's pretty amazing and it's great to be part of it. Um, hopefully everybody's maybe heard of Expedia and Hotels.com, um, but obviously we are an online travel agent and, and retailer uh, across some of the vision that Microsoft talked about, so stitching flights, cars, experiences, so when you're there, hotels, things like vacation rentals as well now as part of the family. So we have, if you think, um, as I do on this, fundamentally we are actually AI is at the core of why we exist. We exist to find the right flight, holiday, hotel experience for you. So um, the big, by far one of the biggest use cases is actually when you get to our site and try and search, we're mining all of that data, all of the signals, both your user features and signals, wider micro segments, wider business ones, to find the perfect thing for you. And that's really why we exist. And that's our, probably our biggest use case. There's lots of other ones which I'll get to, but there we go. Hello, uh, my name is Dan Moros. I'm the director of customer experience at a company called Moo.com. Um, we're an online business card and business stationery printer. Um, I started out in the call center world um, and most recently have uh, adopted a new uh, self-service tool that's powered by some fairly basic, compared to some of the other examples, AI uh, and machine learning. Um, it's a tool called AnswerDash. Um, which is contextual support, uh, self-service support, which using natural language processing and um, visitor-generated data to give contextual support where that customer is in the online <coughs> journey. Um, and that's had not only great cost-saving benefits to us in the contact center, but also has delivered on the top line uh, additional revenue uh, through increased conversion uh, and average order value. Hi, so I'm Will Venters. I'm a member of faculty in the Department of Management at the London School of Economics. I'm not an economist. I am much more uh, interested in the managerial and social and business uses of technology. And my research looks at how businesses can take advantage of new digital technologies and how those digital technologies shape and change businesses. So I'm particularly interested today in essentially moving the debate on beyond um, solutionism, the kind of we have a product, let's now match it to some need that we don't entirely understand from businesses, to actually integrating these type of technologies into real business problems, whether they're kind of low-hanging fruit or whether we can project into the future in a much more what will a highly cognitive AI solution do to businesses? What, what does the future mean if we do see the kind of highly advanced AI coming into business applications. And, and what would be an example of one of those business problems that, that you're looking at? Could you pick one out? Is, would you be happy to talk about one example? Um, 
So I'm part of the outsourcing unit uh, at the <coughs> LSE as well, and my colleague Leslie Wilcox and Mary Lassity, um, who's at Minnesota, have been looking at um, robotic process automation. And I think it's interesting, Blue Prisma are here, and essentially looking at how organizations can take advantage of, of AI uh, type technology to deal with the low, the, when we talk about low hanging fruit, it's the kind of swivel chair business process activities, the sort of swimming fr swinging from taking email or chat in to putting it into systems of record like ERP solutions. And these are huge problems for many businesses. I mean, how you actually go about doing that and how much your business spends on doing those really basic things and how much va value you could get if you could automate that or percentages of that, not all of it, but just the, the small percentage of that offers real tangible business savings rather than kind of looking at advanced super Cortina type solutions, just really basic things inside the business processes where we could strip out value that can be done cheaply and effectively and is essentially the boring repetitive work that business process outsourcers find difficult because their staff find it boring. I mean, it's just hard to motivate people to do that. Much better to strip that out and then offer much more interesting, challenging business process roles for those people. Brilliant, let's come back to that. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, my name is Mark Florette. Until yesterday afternoon, I was still the Chief Digital Officer of Engie. Not anymore, so things are going quick. Engie, maybe you don't know it, uh, has changed uh, its name uh, quite often. So it's uh, an energy company, uh, 75 billion euro turnover, present on most of the continents. And we are specialized not only in electricity and gas, but also renewable and services and um, mainly focus as for the strategy for energy transition. So speaking about the, the topic of today, I will say, and this was not very much mentioned uh, so far, uh, we have of course two, two or maybe three main areas where we can use artificial intelligence or uh, related <coughs> uh, topics of this, this kind. And maybe I will focus first on the assets because we talk about customers, which is very important. We have millions of customers, so it's of importance. But as for the assets, uh, I will say maybe two, two, two examples. The first one is about maintenance. We have uh, industrial assets of uh, high value. Uh, let's say, for instance, uh, turbines, gas turbines, or wind turbines. <coughs> and we, we may do two things on, on these turbines. First of all, to have predictive maintenance in order to make the maintenance not too early because you, you, <coughs> you lose money or not too, too late because you, you even lose uh, much more. Or you, you can increase the efficiency up to the point where uh, something uh, may happen of, uh, not for, for the durability of the turbine. Uh, so this is one example and of course it increases the, the profitability of the asset. The second example has to do with security and we using uh, drones and uh, processing of images uh, to inspect uh, um, uh, the, the, the network, the high pressure network that we have in France. Of course it's varied, but wh what we, we fear the most is civil work being done in the surrounding. Mm -hmm. And so this is the idea of uh, inspecting uh, very often in order to avoid uh, damages that could be very harmful and uh, uh, we had uh, in, in Belgium or in the US there were very serious accidents about it. So these are the, the, the two examples I wanted to, to, to give in the assets. And by the way, all these assets, most of the assets require, and this was not even, not much said during the, the, the speech about uh, the, the trends, the new trends or, or the, the art, the state of the art of uh, AE. Uh, for me, I think something very important is what is called the IoT. I didn't hear this word uh, being mentioned very, very often, and this is going to change uh, again our life because data has to come from somewhere. All right. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're working twice today, so um, the <laughs> spot, uh, clearly yes. getting good value from you. So. Great. Uh, good morning once again. Uh, my name is Harry Quinn. I am head of uh, this new unit. You can think, look, I think of it as a startup. It's a Tata Consultancy Services venture uh, called Digitate that has been formed to take, build and take Igneo to market. Uh, Igneo is a neural automation platform or a cognitive system. 
um, in fact, when we started this journey, uh, the whole ex uh, the, the motivation was some of the points that you made, made earlier about the fact that the way we design, build, and run enterprises or business is highly manual and very, very people-centric. Uh, we are doing lots of mundane things uh, that can actually be automated. So with Igneo, what we have done is uh, we've Igneo essentially allows us to make enterprise operations smarter, faster, and a lot easier to manage. And it does so by essentially building a layer of intelligence on top of existing technology plumbing, if you will, that exists within the enterprise. And it does essentially four things. It does sense, think, act, and learn. So sense the environment to build the context, exactly like how our brain works. Uh, it has the ability to do a um, lot of machine learning and deep learning to derive insights and recommendations. It operationalizes those recommendations by performing actions, and then it continuously learns um, not only the enterprise context, but also the quality of decisions and actions that it took in order to keep improving knowledge. So in effect, with Igneo, what we have done is we have pioneered this concept of, as we call it, services as software. So this is not software as a service. This is basically anything that you can define today as a service can actually be converted into an intelligent piece of software by that essentially thinks and acts like, a, like an expert. So, so um, if I could ask a question and then maybe for the rest of the panel. Um, we talk about those mundane, you, you mentioned the kind of the boring jobs um, and, and we can deal with those. How do people get trained? How do they learn? In, in my profession, of course, people come in, they do relatively mundane tasks as they start and they acquire skills and they become more skilled and then they become senior and partners and whatever. H how do people get training if those mundane tasks are gonna disappear? That's an excellent question and it's actually a challenge for the whole industry as things, I mean, it's almost like saying that today to find a, a, an auto mechanic that knows how to actually go and fix something in the car really to triage where the problem is without a machine help is actually probably very difficult. Uh, so that is indeed a challenge. Um, I think the approach that most organizations will have to um, take is one where um, you sort of always have this balance between automation-led intelligent or automate, autonomous operations and sort of human operations. And that's not necessarily to actually do the work, but to actually make sure that people understand how things are actually done underneath the covers. Of course, the skill levels will have to be brought up. So you have to become more of, a, as I said in my presentation earlier, sort of creator and curator of knowledge, but more importantly, uh, the handlers of exceptions. So the ability to, um, if you will be a detective when autonomous operations fail or the knowledge is inadequate on how to deal with it is essentially the skill that would have to be imparted to people. And how's Expedia dealing with that? Um, are, we, are we getting rid of travel agents? Will they not exist anymore? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, so uh, probably answer is no, because I think there's a, there's a value of everybody in the marketplace. I think what you've seen, if you think back to, to 25, 30 years ago, um, Expedia is 20 years old this year. Um, Everybody used to go down to their local travel agents. That's now changed with transparent information. And now AI is helping people find and navigate the complexity of travel, making it simple and easy. But what's happened now is actually, if you look at the marketplace, they went to call centers. Now people are actually coming back to using, in some use cases, for the more complex trips, where um, using those online uh, experiences. Uh, you know, we have a concierge service, um, we actually take a quite a large proportion of our booking still via call centers. So there's people that like the confidence. If you think about travel, it's a trustworthy experience. Whether it's with your partner, your family, your friends, you're investing your trust that when you get there, the experience is great. And that, that confidence is super, super important in our industry. So I think it's about empowering those quote unquote offline capabilities with online skill. So that they have the access to the great prices, they have the AI, they have the capability to give a really great service for those people that want to use that, that method. We shouldn't force people. Customers should choose how they want to interact with us. Uh, so in my experience from a call center perspective, and I think Nicola Millard, who's speaking later, will touch on this, having seen her talk in the past, um, that in the future, and we're already seeing it now that we've uh, 
have, have some better self-service solutions in place is that the, everyone will need to be an expert. Um, and Nicola Miller talks about super agents of 2020, I think is one of the subjects that she'll talk about later, but I'm now stealing all of her limelight. But um, certainly we found that the complexity of the questions that agents are getting asked uh, has increased. The time to handle those interactions has, has increased. Um, I think in the short term, that poses a problem in kind of reskilling people who don't necessarily ha have the capacity to do those expert jobs. But that over time, you'd hope that, um, that the nation gets smarter um, and also finds a way to kind of coexist and learn from the AI that we have so that they're able to handle those more complex interactions. Um, I was just going to take it sort of in two parts. I mean, the first part is we've created an awful lot of jobs where we've tried to get people to replicate machine intelligence, where they act with a CRM script, where they follow a knowledge management system, where we expect them to be able to join an organization in a second and start answering calls because we expect them to act machinically. But then there's a corollary of your question, which I thought was really interesting, which is, I'm sure PwC invests an awful lot of time in its junior people in, in introducing them into the cultural expectations of the organization, into the social interaction in the organization, in making the organization know they're there and making them know how to interact correctly and work into and navigate all the mess of the organization, you know, the messy email filing systems or the messy organizational <coughs> stuff. And the kind of corollary question is, if we want AI to take on more of those low-level jobs, how do we re repeat and replicate those social understandings inside this machine? Because it isn't going to be able to easily interact with those, those knowledgeable assets, which are tacit. I mean, we, when we had the whole knowledge management debate sort of 10, 15 years ago, there was this argument between tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. And essentially the argument is there's an awful lot in the organization which is tacit. It's the reason many of you have come to this event today because there's something in meeting people and talking to people that you can't get from trolling the internet. Just, you know, one other thing, the ironic thing to some extent is if you take machine learning and artificial intelligence, the source of a lot of those annotated data sets that you learn from, back to as you were a kid, you had books and you learned those things and now kids have iPads, mine do. Um, is things like Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is fundamentally a repetitive, routine, human-based, mundane system. You just pay per unit. It's, it's, a very, it's a different solution service provider of actually probably the similar thing that we still have. Um, is it, you know, a pretty key interesting point to the new world. And, and how do you train and develop the skill in, in the, the engineers? <coughs> well, it depends uh, whom uh, we, are, we are talking about. Um, um, I would say that uh, one way to, to do this is we are trying to develop uh, an ecosystem with uh, uh, we have a, a venture fund with 100 million euro and we invest in a minority in, in uh, startups and the idea is these startups are being taken care by uh, uh, special BU so there is a contact and it's a kind of we try to have a win-win situation and this is a way to maybe for engineers to uh, to develop new, new skills and to, to make uh, this kind of progress. So there is another, another thing that I have applied for the top management, but that maybe could be applied uh, to answer your question. We didn't do it, but it's uh, listening to, the, to, to my colleagues. Uh, I developed the reverse mentor, mentoring for, for the top management, the CEO and the, the, the executive committee. But I'm thinking that this might be applied also for uh, for maybe training, uh, maybe people who are not completely aware of what's going on. But nevertheless, you, you cannot transform somebody who has not the capabilities, depending on his, his age, in a data scientist. I mean, uh, you cannot uh, acquire uh, statistic uh, capacities or maybe language programming, but I mean, depending where you start, you can, uh, but uh, it's better when you can uh, have time in order to uh, maybe evaluate situation when you have uh, data evaluation already and so the, you, your brain can work and uh, so I think this is uh, right. one of the answers. And, and, and that's an interesting point about creating a venture fund. Is that something that, that Dr. done in terms of you know, building and thinking about how we encourage 
this huge explosion of innovation in organizations. Uh, is that something that, that you've thought about? Is it something that you do? Do you take that? In fact, I mean, the, the, the organization that we have created, Digitate, is you can think of it as a venture within the larger Tata group, right? So the, it's designed, we are fundamentally, when you look at services as software, you are fundamentally changing, if you will, the conventional business model, right? So questioning the traditional business model of uh, people-centric services. So the only way you can actually do this is by creating a new venture and go off and build some of these technologies. So uh, creating these internal ventures is, I think, going to be an in increasingly important part of any large enterprise. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, that, that you see? Uh, which, the creation of uh, independent units within <coughs> businesses? Yeah, how do you release this huge, innovative, if people have now got more time because they're doing less of mm -hmm. the, the tedious jobs? Um, how do you capture that? So I think the, the, there's a challenge to harness people's creative outputs. So often in business, there's a focus on more scientific, uh, data-based things. Um, and certainly in our organization, there's a real focus on um, thinking outside of the box and, and uh, being creative. And that might even be, you know, the um, probably wouldn't be, but you know, right down to the janitor who's working. They have good ideas. Um, and I think it's important that we're giving opportunities to everyone across the business, not just those who are working in a creative space, um, to be able to you know, develop ideas. I think certainly there's much more um, ideation going on in organizations that probably wasn't going on as much in the past. Um, even those that don't have the technical nous or knowledge, you know, that they still can, ha can have the, the kernel of an idea that can, can with others, you know, come together into a, a really beautiful creation. Right. I think say crowdsourcing, sorry. Sorry. Crowd, no, I was just yeah. saying, so crowdsourcing is a good way to actually mature some of these concepts. So many enterprises are actually leveraging internal social platforms to essentially ideate and convert, sort of do the filtering to actually identify the ones that they should invest in. So should we try and crowdsource a question? Yes. Um, there's a lady down here at the front. There should be a mic somewhere. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask for um, those of us in heavily regulated industries. So I'm from Bayer, and we focus on human, animal, and plant science. And these areas are all heavily regulated. Safety is important, and ultimately the EPA or the FDA will be the judge whether they accept a dossier that has artificial intelligence built into the strategy. Any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so how do we do a regulation? Who would like to, to, to pick that one up? Unfortunately, you've okay. got the mic. So I, I seem to have been given the microphone. Um, so let me attack it. I, I think there's something really interesting about what we see the role of decision making in organizations. And I think we've become very much accepting of the idea that it should be scientifically rational and therefore we should be evidence based. And that's very good. But then we have to sort of start questioning. With this AI support, the fact that the data on which the AI is often built is, in a sense, I mean, there is no raw data. Raw data is always cooked at some level. It has been constructed from something. Decisions have been made of what is collected and what isn't collected. And when we talk about unstructured data, it's necessarily partial. It is going to be a partial perspective on our organization because some things aren't going to be available or are or are structured in different ways or are hidden because we're conversa having conversations around the water cooler. And therefore, when we start building AI solutions which build evidence-based practice, we need to evaluate whether or not that ossifies a particular perspective in the organization. Now, that may be great for a regulated industry where we can look and say, this is absolutely you know, justified on the basis of these pieces of evidence which are um, published material or, or valuable material. That could be really useful. It could, however, ossify a particular perspective in a business that's trying to be dynamic and creative and do something different and isn't perhaps constrained by that regulatory idea to force them to, they're relying on an idea of data which isn't, which is over perhaps overplaying that scientific perspective. So I think we need as organizations to decide whether we want to take data as truth and therefore look at that past data. It's always past, isn't it? Data is always from the historic, um, in which we build our decision-making and our actions, 
or do we want to take something much more aesthetic or more future looking? I mean, Apple didn't look much of the past in the design of its products or the design of its, its thinking. It's an idea of being innovative. So could we drill I'm not answering the question. Could we drill really? down a bit into that, that okay. regulatory piece? Um, you know, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of bias that comes up as we make decisions and, and potentially using artificial intelligence correctly eliminates some of that human bias and actually creeps in. How do you deal with that in the, in the travel world where, actually, I went to a lovely hotel, you ought to go there too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess, I think, actually, a couple of things I got on just in the, say, the pharma world, to be, uh, take a second, is I wonder how much, it just, I don't know pharma that well, but is how much is around the, using AI to discover new things? And I guess, you know, the regulators, I was assume, was looking at risk, you know, a drug goes wrong or something like that. So I guess there might be a lot more opportunity as regulator comes along and then communication, but discovering new things, mining that data, finding new discoveries and the machine saying, hey, look at this result out of the billions of possible compounds, it looks a good one. And then you put it through the trials, maybe that's one area. But in travel, um, a couple of things, I guess regulation, I mean, clearly we are playing with data and the privacy regulatory environment around data is clearly growing and is, and, and, um, I actually call it the implicit contract. So yes, there's the, the regulators, but more importantly, there's a contract with customers. You know, you're processing their data, it's theirs, fundamentally, and there's an implicit contract that they get value from what you're doing with that data. So actually, I think that's, I actually look at maybe, yes, we have regulators and very important ones, but our, our fundamental regulator is our customer, who will not use us, who will not give us their data if they don't trust us. Um, back to say travel, um, it's fundamentally a confidence and trust piece. Right. So um, if you're on the data piece, we have tens of millions of reviews. We have tens of thousands now just launched uh, photos that users send us. So you don't have to trust what we have collected, per se. It's <coughs> what other people are telling us, what your you know, fellow people and, and us are showing. And it's all about how do we mine all those tens of millions of unstructured information to help provide what people are saying, rather than um, you know, it's, it's the age of the owner and, and the, the customer having that information. You know, we have now a million real-time reviews. As soon as you get there, people are leaving reviews immediately. And then the hoteliers are, you know, and the airlines are seeing those and reacting to them and giving you much better service. So it's much more of a faster you know, construction information of people giving you that feedback immediately and reacting to it immediately. Right. And that's the change in travel that's happened already and will continue to happen. We need, a, we need a robot that will take the microphone around. I'll, I'll do my best. You, you had a question. Hi, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, Vincenzo from UBS. I'm a newcomer to the topic. Uh, in fact, the reason I'm here is I wanted to learn a little bit more, but I'm a little bit confused because we kind of seem to be putting under the same bucket kind of old-fashioned digitization topics like process automation, data mining, workflow management, and in, in my mind, at least, AI was something very specific, which is technology related to maybe unprogrammable tasks is one way. But it seems like we're rebranding everything. You know, I heard this today many times, oh, this has existed for 60 years or more, AI. I'm really confused, I have to say. What is it that is distinctive to AI? And what is the boundary, which is just digitization and artificial intelligence? Uh, great question. Um, are we conflating too many different things? Um, what really is AI that we're talking about? Yeah, maybe uh, let me take a shot. Um, so I think it's a great point. And if you remember the chart that I showed earlier, there are three levels. There is the digitization is sort of the base level, which is essentially uh, sensing and collecting a lot of information. Uh, then the second phase is applying a lot of machine learning to derive insights uh, from that. And then the eventual sort of uh, the highest level is being able to offload tasks or make the systems completely autonomous. So I think where you're absolutely right, if you really look at big data, a lot of analytics and so on, it's essentially the first two levels of that journey. Where I think everything is getting pushed towards is the third and the fourth stage of that maturity curve, right? Uh, but that does not mean that you don't need the first two. So they are sort of creating the foundation for doing number three and number four. You cannot, you just think about how you and I work. 
if you blindfold ourselves and take away the ability to become context aware, your ability to carry out actions or activities will dramatically go down, right? Uh, it's exactly the same problem here. So uh, are people confusing the terminology? Indeed, uh, it's, it's sort of the flavor of the month, if you will, uh, in terms of packaging everything under one term. But all of these are essentially foundations that the current solutions are essentially building upon. That's why you'll see sort of this uh, confusion probably persist for a little while at least. And, and your story about um, creating sensors and then using drones and, and yeah. so on. So, um, how are you managing to keep those things separate or indeed are you keeping those things separate in the way your organization's thought about? Well, we don't keep them separate, right. of course. <laughs> and uh, to give an example about the IoT, we decided to, to it's a kind of new uh, uh, growth vector that we, we are engaging in this, in this topic and we are deploying in Belgium the whole network, it's telecom, it's not really our job, but we believe that <coughs> it will help a lot in our uh, work and, and beyond. Um, I would like to come back to, to the question because previously, before I was uh, CDO, I was in charge of research. Many years ago, I have been working, we have been working with, for instance, uh, neuronal uh, networks. So when I worked, uh, neuronal uh, networks being uh, uh, something uh, linked with artificial intelligence, I, I said to myself, well, this is not really new. Yes. But maybe what is, which is new is maybe the capability of computing in the cloud, uh, maybe the, the fact of having many layers of this neuronal network, so it, it gives more capability. So uh, this is a question nevertheless that I asked to myself before coming here. What is really artificial intelligence? I'd, I'd agree, so I guess just to add to that, so you know, back at university, a couple of decades ago, I hasten to add, you know, I built an artificial intelligent Cluedo player, which just to say has yet to be beaten, and it wants to challenge it. But it's been around for a very long time. Yeah. That was in Prologue on the back of an ancient PC that probably cost a fortune in those days. Um, I think it's an evolution to your question. So there's lots of hype and misclaiming of terms. And for me, there's a continuum. And I, and I don't think you can necessarily sort of say, hey, it stops here, starts here. It's more what machine learning are doing, sitting, in, I would say, in the travel space, is about how do you scale. There's now, you know, there's, there's a lot of options for everybody. If you think of a flight, the number of ways of getting from one place to another, times on multiple flights, multiple prices, there's a lot of complexity. The only way we help people navigate that complexity in real time is using the intelligence that machines can bring rather than necessarily you know, an augmenting some of the learning that people, people can have. Then you move it into where we're going with some of our FAQ and chat capabilities. And if you think of like, you know, I don't know, for the last couple of decades, every travel site, tell me where you want to go, dates, a bit of other information, click go, and you get a list. That's what's been happening. Everyone's been doing that. Um, the revolution, to your point, you know, is going to evolve. And maybe in you know, a few years' time, it won't be like that. Uh, you'll speak to the machine, like you can do now on mobile phones, pretty interestingly. And also, you'll have just a text bar saying, I fancy doing this, please. Yeah. I want to go in the summer, um, possibly Italy, don't know, maybe Spain, a couple of weeks here. Um, it can you know, tell me where my holiday, how much holiday I've got, just use that. And it'll start to be cross-linked, it'll start to understand, rather than you just tell it key facts, it's mining those keywords. It really starts to understand you and your past, but also your future. And that's, I think, is the transition, but yeah, there's a walking and running, I think. Um, I kind of think, in a sense, you could throw the question back, in a sense, what on earth would a business want a new technology to exist like AI? We, Larry Ellison famously said that there's nothing more fashion-led uh, than the IT industry. Uh, we, we could see AI as a new fashion that is rebadging a load of old ideas, but essentially technology has always been about adding value to an organization. It's about what can it do that helps a business do something slightly better? And I completely agree. There's a kind of evolutionary idea around the capacity of computing. You look at Moore's law, you look at cloud computing, you look at the availability of kind of near infinite computing capacity on demand available anywhere inside IoT devices, matched with data analytics, AI type solutions, there's kind of the ability to crunch through this data and to produce very interesting inferences which, are la which act in a human-like way. And then adding those to the solutions that businesses already have. Because otherwise, we're not contributing to the value generation that those businesses have. 
Um, and that essentially was where the, you look at the successful technologies through the, the ages, it wasn't whether we called them ERP solutions, CRM solutions, et cetera, it was where they matched the needs of a business um, with real problems that businesses have. And I think therefore, and when we look and evaluate AI, we should be evaluating it through the, those lenses. And I think there is something new here. I mean, looking at um, some of the solutions that are presented, they're evolution, but they're big evolution. I mean, things have exploded exponentially because computing has exploded exponentially and is available. And, and does that then raise the question of, is the business case so obvious that actually it's easy to get money to uh, develop and invest within the business? Is, is that your experience, actually? It's very easy to get the board to sign up to this? I was going to say, inside Expedia, um, Yes, is my answer to that. Um, our chairman announced about a month ago that AI was going to be the next revolution of travel, which is very helpful for getting funds. Um, so I think it's interesting, and in in some of the questions out there was, it's, it's how do you go about doing that? So you know, we've got a very you know, decent investment. Some of it's very speculative. I don't know what the value is. I don't have to prove the value. We'll see how it goes. But some of it's more evolutionary. As long as you can test and learn and keep showing that value, um, and I think it'll, it'll evolve, evolve, but it's, it's never normally a massive big bang solution, certainly in my experience. Sometimes you stumble across those things and they're amazing when they happen. It's not the rule. The rule is keep on learning and learning, look at what you do. Um, but I've never had the challenge of, of, of uh, investments. And the other one I guess I'll make on that is we're knee deep moving to the cloud, um, particularly Amazon and, and Azure and Google, uh, all three. Um, I guess the interesting piece to me is that it transforms the investment decision. So you think old IT, if use that language, was all about massive business case, multi-year, you know, big, big program team, you know, very big deals, big investments. One thing I think the cloud does, particularly with AI, is transform that equation. It turns it into low opportunity cost. I don't have to make a bet if that new technology, if that new innovation, that new idea is going to win. Um, I can try lots at the same time and pick the winner. And that transforms the conversation. So there's one thing, hopefully, from this is that that gives you the capability. You haven't got to guess. You haven't got to be right. Um, you can actually experiment and find the right thing for you. And I think that transform. that's, for me, is the transformation leap. All these other things are great, but that makes it so that what's ever right for your business and your customers, right. you're, you're able to find it that way. So you, that's can, the you, win. You, can, you can work smaller and experiment, is that, yeah. is that what you see? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with the testing part, but I think with most businesses, um, you have you know, your inputs, um, and then you have either people or machines that process that information, come up with the solutions, and then you have your output. Uh, and the goal of that output is normally to deliver new revenue, uh, or to save money, uh, or to improve the customer experience, or all of those things. And I think what, what AI, I don't think it's a question of AI is, is on vogue, so it's going to get the seal of approval in the boardroom. I think the same with any other thing that you need to provide a business case for. Um, if you can prove that, uh, that a new AI solution is going to process those inputs better and provide a better output, then you're going to get a green light. But I think, in, in my experience, testing and showing the benefit is always going to get you the, the rubber stamp. Well, the one thing we haven't managed to crack is uh, time travel. Um, and we've overrun. I, I don't like the idea of travel company investing in clouds. I think that's a bad thing. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, thank you um, for, for talking today. Um, and again, a, there's so much that one could debate around this particular subject, and I think we've barely even scratched the surface of the surface. So lots more, um, and the rest of the day, really, to debate some of those issues. So thank you very much. Thank you, Karen. Yes.